BBC Four Collections, specially chosen programmes from the BBC Archive. This collection traces the BBC's first steps into archaeology programming. More programmes on this theme and other BBC Four Collections are available on BBC iPlayer. This afternoon before you came in, I'd been taking one of those nostalgic walks which I occasionally am afraid indulge in. And this one is my favourite one. It takes me down to the embankment by the Thames, opposite that extraordinary building, the National Liberal Club. And then I walk along from that point towards, towards Westminster. And as I approach Westminster, on my right, there is a very remarkable building indeed. And with that building, I have all sorts of affinity. I tell you, first of all, biological affinity. That building was being built at the time that I was born. It was being built here, and I was born in a place called Glasgow. No, Glasgow? Indeed. Well, uh, I, I was being born in Glasgow when that building was being born here in London. New Scotland Yard. New Scotland Yard. That building has two great round towers, one at each corner, facing upon the river. And in one of those towers, it so happens, and this is a matter of purely personal interest, uh, that um, uh, I uh, spent my first hours and days and weeks uh, as, an, as a professional archaeologist. Uh, at that time, in spite of the fact that most of the building was occupied by the, uh, the Metropolitan Police Force, Somehow or other, by some contrivance or other, this tower had been partially allotted to an obscure Royal Commission. The Royal Commission on Historical Monuments for England. They allotted me uh, to the editorial staff. And the editorial staff at those days was one man, Alfred Clapham, later on Sir Alfred Clapham, uh, who immediately became my closest friend and remained my closest friend until he died 20 years ago. Well, I remember on one occasion, Clapham, we always called each other by our surnames to the end of our days. He died with my surname on his lips. And uh, we used to have this co little conversation for 10 minutes, 10 minutes precisely, about some irrelevant subject. On one occasion, he, a Yorkshireman, told me about a very remarkable ancient monument, a, a series, an enormous series, miles long, of earthworks in northern Yorkshire at a place called Stanick. Our conversation was interrupted, I remember, by the fact that across the adjacent Westminster Bridge, past the, the, the statue of Gurdjieff, there was marching a, a battalion of infantrymen in, uh, in khaki. It was two days before the opening of the First World War, and the, the, the troops were assembling. And we looked at that and forgot Sanic. And then, my mind is a blank in this respect, for, say, nearly 40 years. And then, nearly 40 years later, after two world wars and all sorts of minor sub-adventures or non-adventures in peacetime, uh, I found myself back in London, sitting in my room at the... Uh, in the University of London, where apparently I was some sort of professor, one of those things. And um, my door opened, and in came a man whom I recognised as the Chief Inspector of Ancient Monuments, the man in charge of all the ancient buildings in the country. And he uh, uh, said he'd come. I said, do, do you represent the King? And he looked rather like it. And he said, uh, no, not exactly.
simply, but I represent the Ministry of Works. And I've come to, with, to you with a petition. And the petition was this. In the following year, it, it was 1950, in the following year, 1951, it had been intended, it was intended, uh, to, to hold a festival of Britain, a sort of uh, centenary of the uh, Great Exhibition in Hyde Park in 1851, and the site chosen was precisely opposite uh, the um, uh, New Scotland Yard, on the other side of the Thames. And it may be that uh, th there was a, a remote association in my mind between the two. But anyway, his petition was this. The, uh, the Ministry of Works, representing the government, offer you the excavation, the means to excavate, any site you like in England, uh, provided it's available, at any cost that you like to name. Well, of course, this uh, is a sort of thing that happens to you in a, a dream. Uh, here it was, here was the world on a plate. And he said, he went on to say, oh, don't, uh, and of course, hurry with your answer. It's a big question. Uh, take your time. I said, no, I'll tell you now. My mind went back over those 40 years in that flash of an instant to our little conversation all those years ago in the turret, in the tower, corner tower of uh, New Scotland Yard. And I said, I'll do the, uh, the earthworks at Stanick. Then I added, I've never been there, I've never seen them, but if they're what I think they're said to be, what they're, they're alleged to be, then uh, I can't do them unless I have the whole finances of the, what is left of the British Empire to work upon. But since you offer me those finances, I'm prepared to say yes. Uh, what about going up there and having a look at the place next week? Next week we went. Northern Yorkshire, five miles from Darlington. The, the rain streaming down like an oriental monsoon. We were in gum boots and Macintoshes and things, and we climbed for mile after mile across walls, through hedges, over earthworks which seemed interminable. Banks, ramparts, ditches of various kinds, uh, uh, an integral work of defence of some kind or other. Who built it? No one knew. No one knew what it contained. Although, of course, as one began to think over it, one came to certain conclusions or conclusions. Which you're obviously not going to tell me right oh, now. Oh, no. It, it, it wouldn't be artistic to tell you at this stage. But uh, the, uh, you know, when we got down to work, one had to ask that question. Now, where, in six miles, are you going to dig with the hope of finding anything? You don't just dig in the blue. You take a place where there was an entrance, an entrance through which traffic must have converged. It's, it's at the entrance that, in ancient times, the passers-by or the people coming in would throw away their cigarette packets and so on. You can imagine them throwing away their rubbish or, or sticking up things that they wanted to attract the attention of others. I put my principal diggers onto the entrance. He carved into it. I shall never forget this. It was a deep, great deep ditch ending at a causeway, ending abruptly at a causeway. It was carved partly in, in the rock. It had been filled in, since, since ancient times by uh, a marsh, by liquid mud, a pool. And I shan't forget sitting there and watching my foreman, an expert foreman of mine who'd been with me for many years in this country, uh, digging there and suddenly stopping with his pick in midair. He was about to bring it down, he stopped. And looking over his shoulder, there was a, a sword, a, a full-length sword in its scabbard, lying in the mud intact. A Celtic sword in a sheath, not of metal as they ordinarily are, but in a, a, a sheath of wood. And when you say Celtic sword, I'm, Celtic to me suggests um, wild Scotsman with kilts and hairy knees, uh, coming, tearing down from the highlands and invading England. Celtic is, is a word now which suggests northern, but how are you using the term? No, I'm using it in a wider sense. Are you a Celt? No, I'm an Icelander, sir. 
Iceland, uh, oh, I don't We have 40% uh, Celtic blood in us. Yes, I, I, I knew you were tainted. <laughs> well, immediately I did two things. I sent for my assistant director and got her to go to the village to instruct a, the local carpenter to make uh, an oblong box, a sort of little coffin box, in, in which, which would take the, uh, the sword when I lifted it. Secondly, I made a tracing of the outline of the sword in case anything should happen to it, in, while it still lay in the mud before we touched it. And then finally, the little box arrived in about half an hour, done very quickly. Uh, the, the village carpenter brought the box along, and the foreman and I lifted very carefully this uh, wooden sword scabbard containing the iron sword up in our hands and laid it gently very gently indeed into the box still covered with its mud and uh, bolstered with wet moss and so on to keep it wet in transit i rang up the british museum laboratory in london and said i asked the uh, uh, the chief man there uh, dr plenderleaf the skillful chemist uh, to be good enough to wait uh, until uh, my messenger had arrived. I sent my assistant up with this box, wrapped up exactly as it was found. In, um, uh, in the next train, she arrived that evening with the box. And as the uh, chemist, uh, Dr. Plenderleaf, told me afterwards, and actually he has written, uh, the preservation of this remarkable relic was due entirely to the fact, of course, that we took those precautions that we had prevented the wood from drying and splitting as it would have done. Now, why did you find this sword so remarkable? It's in the British Museum now. It, it has a pride of place there, but there are surely lots of swords 2,000 years old and older than 2,000 years. Why were you so excited when you found it? I'll tell you for two reasons. First, uh, excited is not the word I use. Why not? I'm never excited. I don't believe no scientist is ever excited. Don't use the word. It's a terrible word. Mag. Uh, but the point is that it, it was uh, of interest for two reasons. First of all, so far as I know, it's the only wooden scabbard of its kind found in this country or found, so far as I know, anywhere else too. Uh, wood doesn't last in most European soils. This had been preserved by the accident of its having fallen originally or been thrown originally into this great heap of wet mud which had kept it airtight for 19 centuries. Secondly, I'll tell you, close alongside this scabbard, there lay a human skull, which had been severed from the body. The body was not there. Uh, no signs of the body, uh, but the third or fourth cervical vertebra. And prior to that, the uh, owner of the skull had been killed by being struck violently with a sword, or an axe, probably a sword, th three times upon his skull, across the eyes and the forehead, and a slice off, his, off the top of his skull. He'd been executed and beheaded, and his head had been strung up there on a pole at the gate in accordance with an ancient uh, Celtic custom. Uh, the many tribes, uh, many ancient tribes, and they used to do that sort of thing to their foes or to their victims. Why, well, it went on here in London uh, to, 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 the, to the 18th century when heads were exposed on Temple Bar. Same sort of thing. Uh, another, uh, an older and a more brutal age. Well, uh, there it was. We had a picture of the whole thing. This post standing up beside the gate where everybody could see it with the, the skull of the executed man on the top of it and the sword hanging down from it, uh, but in token of, of the dead man's rank and origin. It's a remarkable thing. There it is in the British Museum, you can go and see it.